So Dr. Uh, Hazen was up at Portland State today, gave a little talk up there. We were going to have him out at uh, Oregon Episcopal School, but uh, they had a uh, uh, scheduling conflict, so we didn't get to go out there. But uh, so what we did is we brought somebody from OES to uh, <laughs> introduction. He's not from, he retired, but he built the program out at OES. And he's an awesome guy, he's one of my favorite people in the community as far as science goes. You ever see all these, the Intel and Westinghouse, uh, you know, national science contests? More often than not, there's somebody there from OES. Why is that? I was like, what happens? You know, a lot of bright kids around. Well, this, is the, this guy is the reason. And he just won the National Science Foundation National Science Teachers Association, Desi Distinguished Service, you're going to have to do a Distinguished Service, Science Education. Okay, cl close enough. Anyway, this is an awesome guy who has been behind the scenes doing absolutely fabulous stuff for uh, science and technology and everything in the Portland area. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Bill Lamb. Actually, before I introduce Dr. Hazen, I'm going to make one correction for what Terry said. He said, I built it. And no, I didn't build it. We built it. We had a whole bunch of teachers who have worked really hard on that program at OES. So it's always, anytime you find something big that gets built and stays built, it's a team. So. So typically when I hear Terry introduce people, he gives this long laundry list of what the speakers have done. And Dr. Hazen's a professor at George Mason University. Well, like most teachers, he has to do other things to kind of, you know, keep his, keep himself in food and whatever. So he's a senior staff scientist at the uh, Car Carnegie Institute for the Geophysical Laboratory and most recently, he's become executive director and principal investigator, principal investigator of the Deep Carbon Observatory. I'll talk about that in a few seconds. Author of numerous publications, I'm not going to list any of them. Receiver of numerous awards, and I'm not going to list any of those, but I think they're in the program. And he's had several leadership positions in the profession for a long period of time. His newest initiative, and I expect to hear more about it tonight, is the Deep Carbon Observatory dedicated to achieving transformational understanding of carbon's chemical and biological roles in the Earth's interior. And since we know kind of not very much about carbon's role in the deep interior, pretty much anything they find out is going to be transformational. So that's interesting. And if that sounds interesting to you, and here's the ad, and especially if you're piqued by the talk, you're going to want to pick up a copy of... Uh, Two things, you want to purchase his book downstairs, and then if you're more of a technical bent, there's apparently there's a, uh, an issue uh, that's in the series Reviews in Mineralogy and Geochemistry that's coming out in March called Carbon in the Earth, and you might want to pick that up as well. All right, now, one of his uh, interests, astrobiology and the origin of life, has touched several of my former students, including some of those Intel Science Talent Search winners that Terry has talked about. Although his work often focuses on what have might, might have happened under conditions of high pressure and high temperature, whether deep in the earth or at submarine locations like the famous black smokers, some ideas, such as the effect of transition metal sulfides as carbon fixation catalysts, or the formation of RNA polymers on certain kinds of clays can be and have been tested at one atmosphere and temperature, temperatures in the range of boiling water by high school students. Preschool students are, or can be, deeply interested in the topics in which Dr. Hayes and his colleagues at the Deep Carbon Observatory are, are interested. So I want to find out how many high school students are in the audience tonight. Stand up. Stand up. Those of you down here can't see up in the balcony, but there's a bunch of them up there as well. So they're here. And I know Dr. Hazen is listening because he's sitting right there while I finish this introduction. So I'm going to take this opportunity to encourage him, to encourage his many colleagues to include talented younger students in the design and construction of the new instruments, 
I'm paraphrasing their website here. Also, I hope DCO distributes those instruments to investigators who are going to create opportunities for bright pre-college students to do some of the research work. It's a lot easier to plan successful pipeline filling initially than it is to tack it on as an afterthought, which is what we've pretty much done as a nation for decades. So this is a good opportunity to kind of do it right as you do the other stuff right as well. The nice thing about the younger kids is they don't really know what they can't do. And so often they go ahead and do the things that the older ones think they can't do. And so there's reasons to have them on staff even if they're not trained scientists. All right, I've used enough of ICEP's pulpit to make my pitch. Please welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. Robert Hazen. Good evening, and thank you so much for that gracious introduction and the opportunity to know a little bit more about you. I'm so delighted to see that there are students here at the Carnegie Institution, and of course at George Mason. We're very committed to the education of younger scientists. And I think that one of the exciting things about what I'm talking about tonight, the co-evolution of Earth and life, has to do with the opportunities it presents for new research directions that it's the next generation who will pursue. Indeed, my colleagues are many. It's a growing list. They're from all over the country and beyond. And many of these people are young scientists who are just getting started in their career. I want to highlight particularly my colleagues at Johns Hopkins, at the University of Arizona. Um, Joshua Golden and Melissa McMillan are both young scientists. Um, Ed Grew at University of Maine. These are people whose work I'll highlight tonight as we talk about this fascinating way of thinking about Earth. I've got four tasks I want to do tonight. It's so much fun to talk about this. I, I want to tell you about this new concept, mineral evolution. The idea that Earth's mineralogy has changed through time. I want to then focus in particular on 10 stages of Earth history that represent different ways that Earth's near-surface environment has appeared and different environments which have been created for that reason. I want to look at some of the implications of this field of mineral evolution and finally look at some recent discoveries which I think are particularly exciting because they give us new insight into how our planet works. Okay, what is mineral evolution? Well, first, what's a mineral? A mineral is defined as a natural crystalline material that is, it has a structure, a solid structure, with atoms that repeat in regular repeating units. And it also has some well-defined compositional range. So if you satisfy those two criteria, you have a regular crystal structure with a known compositional range. That's a separate individual mineral species. And what we'll see is that through Earth history, the diversity of mineral species has increased radically, dramatically, over four and a half billion years. There's also a change in the relative abundance of the minerals that appear at or near Earth's surface. There's significant changes in the compositional range of those minerals, including the very trace and also minor elements that are incorporated into those structures. That changes systematically, as we'll see. And even things as basic as the size and the shape of the mineral grains. Rem amazing changes that have occurred, largely as the result of biological influences on the near-surface environment. Okay, why do we focus on the near-surface environment? Because this is what we are most able to study. It's what we can see in other planets and moons, and it's where life is likely to interact with those minerals. But one could also talk about the mineral evolution of the entire planet, including the deep interior. But we're going to focus on the near surface. Now, why would anyone do this? Why reframe the science of mineralogy, which has been well established for hundreds of years? And one reason is because mineralogy has fallen on hard times. I loved collecting minerals when I was a boy. I continued to have a fascination throughout my, my life. But I've noticed over the past 50 years that there is a change in attitudes toward this field, which seems to somehow take minerals out of context. They focus on the objects, on their physical and chemical properties, their crystal structures, their compositions, their optical properties, hardness, color, devoid, divorced from any geological context. You go to a mineral museum and indeed they're fascinating and beautiful specimens, crystals that you can see that, that are glorious. 
and yet somehow the geological context is never described. It may tell you where the mineral came from, but what was the accompanying rock like? What was the role of life in the origin of that mineral? And how did it form? So these questions are not discussed in most mineral collections, and, and I think that here we need to get away from this idea of thinking of minerals as isolated objects, but bring them into the story, the narrative of Earth history. It's also very important to NASA to understand the evolution of different planets, of different moons. And minerals are the tangible remains that give us the most direct and preservable evidence for that history. So this is very important for NASA. It's interesting in education. We talk about science education and how important it is to, to convey to a general audience as wide as possible the excitement and the principles of science. But one of the great lightning rods in this country in science is the arguments against evolution, the, the tensions between science and religion. And yet we see throughout the cosmos evolving systems. The idea that systems go from simplicity to complexity. And mineral evolution is a wonderful example of this, which may not have some of the emotional stress associated with talking about the evolution of life or the evolution of humans, so forth. So we understand some general principles about all evolving systems. And finally, for me as a mineralogist, as someone who's studied this for, for many years, it's a wonderful way to ask new questions. And as all of you know, if you're students, the, the, the most exciting thing in science is not memorizing stuff. I mean, memorizing the periodic table or, or memorizing certain laws and equations. It's discovering all the things we don't know and then using our curiosity, our inherent curiosity, to move forward and answer some of those questions to get closer to an understanding of how our cosmos works. Mineral evolution helps us do that. Okay. I have to make a comment about evolution. I have been criticized on a number of fronts saying, you can't call this mineral evolution. You have to call it something else. And I would argue, no, no, that's not true. There's a long, long history in earth sciences and many other sciences of talking about evolving systems. In, in a classic book, The Evolution of the Igneous Rocks, is something known to every geology student. It's just one of those classics, and we use this all the time. So what do I mean by evolution? One thing is the change over time. That's the first thing, and that's the most basic definition of evolution. There's also an implication that a system becomes more interesting through time, more patterned, more diverse, more complex, if you will, whatever. Whatever word you want to use, these systems tend to show that. And there's a third thing, congruency. That means that each stage of the process of evolution follows logically from the previous stage. So there's a sequence. It's not just a bunch of random things that happens, but rather a progression of some sort. All of those things are true for mineral evolution. However, it is not, I repeat, not Darwinian evolution. A crystal of quartz is a crystal of quartz is a crystal of quartz. However, there are changes, but we have to just get that out of your mind. Don't think of crystals. I love that cartoon. It came out a few years ago when this idea was first proposed. So, to give you a sense of how mineral evolution leads to new questions, I want to ask you a question. And maybe one of the students here can, can give me, you know, there's no problem with a wrong answer because no one had even thought of this question until a few years ago. What was the first mineral in the cosmos? What was, now, the thing that's amazing about that question, to me anyway, is not that, you know, you know it's, we, we always think about origins, but I had never, I've looked and looked and looked. I can't find anyone who ever asked that question before. But you think about the Big Bang, and after the Big Bang, and I know you've had lectures that have talked about this, you have the, the creation after a few hundred thousand years of atoms, mostly of hydrogen, some of helium but certainly no minerals there because you have to have a crystalline compound, not a gas, and it has to be cool enough for those crystals to condense into something. So, you then have to form stars. No minerals there. The first stars are much too hot for any crystalline compounds. When, where, and what was the first mineral in the cosmos after the Big Bang? The first crystalline compound that had a regular structure and also had a clearly defined composition. Any? Ice. Ice is interesting. Ice is a good possibility, except it's much too 
cool. Quartz is fascinating. There's a lot of silicon and oxygen, but still too low a temperature. You have to think of something that, that crystallizes. Higher temperature. I heard it. Diamond. It's diamond. It's unbelievable. Is it diamond? It's carbon. Even though the diamond you think has to form in high pressures, it's not true. It can form in a vapor from extremely hot vapor. And so very first crystals formed at something like 4,000 Kelvin in the envelopes of expanding stars. You have a star, either a supernova that explodes, that has a carbon-rich outer layer, or an AGB-type star, which is very energetic and sheds a lot of its mass in energetic waves. These are carbon-rich. The carbon condenses to form nanocrystals of diamond. You get about 400 degrees lower in temperature, and you form graphite, which is another form, the more stable form at low pressure. And then silicon carbide forms, moissanite, a series of strange nitrides, but these are become these are very high temperature phases, and these are concentrated in those elements. A few oxides, maybe a silicate or two, other things. And so what you see is as the star exp expands that envelope, you get cooling, cooling, more and more types of minerals, about a dozen in all. But the interesting thing about them is that they all have to be formed from elements that were abundant in those stars. So carbon is first, we add silicon, we have silicon carbide, then we have nitrides including silicon and titanium nitride, a few others, 10 elements in all, that's all, 10 elements, about a dozen different minerals. And so the question of mineral evolution, the core basic question is how do you go from 12 with only 10 elements to the more than 4,600 mineral species we see on Earth today? That's a process of mineral evolution. And our hope is that if we see this kind of progression, that distribution of minerals through time will tell us about key events in Earth's history. So, how does this occur? How do we get mineral diversification? And it's clear that there are three basic processes that are important. The first is just the selection and concentration of different chemical elements, because most minerals aren't just formed of those 10 original elements that were in high concentrations. They form from elements that are much rarer, or elements that must crystallize or condense at much lower temperatures. So that's one thing. A second is that you have an increasing range as you form planets of various temperatures, pressures, and also compositional niches, if you will. But finally, and most importantly, it's the influence of life. And this is an astonishing realization that only is just now coming to, to light, this idea of the coevolution of life and minerals at the same time. Now, the way that we describe Earth history then is we divide Earth history four and a half billion years plus into three eras of mineral evolution, the era that's associated with all the meteorites that fall to Earth, and then the period before life, and finally the era of life itself. So what I'm going to do is going to take you through Earth history in a series of 10 stages, each of which saw increasing diversification of the mineral world or new types of distributions of minerals at or near Earth's surface. And this then becomes a window on a planet, the story of Earth. So we begin stage one with what are called the primary chondrite meteorites. Imagine, if you will, that early solar nebula. You have a cloud of dust and gas. It's gravitationally clumping together. And most of the mass is falling inward. 99.9% .9 of that mass will form the sun. It's mostly hydrogen and helium, but there's other elements as well. There's a disk as this begins to rotate and collapse. There's a disk that contains dust and, and gases. Also a lot of hydrogen and helium, but all the elements that are gonna form planet Earth. And as the sun begins to collapse and form, it gets pulses of heat as it ignites. The pulses of heat sweep out and bake that inner part of the solar system. It melts the dust into droplets called chondrules. And so we see various kinds of mineral forming objects, what are called calcium aluminum inclusions and chondrules, these little droplet-like materials, but also additional materials. About 60 different minerals in all, including those original 12 Ur minerals. So we've gone from 12 to 60 simply by the refining fires of the sun and that early condensing solar system. Stage two takes us another step further because those chondrites begin to clump together. Gravity affects them as well, and you get larger and larger planetesimals, 10, 
50, 100, 200, 300 kilometers in diameter. And when you reach a certain size, most people think it's around 100 kilometers. The combination of radioactive elements with very short lives and are very energetic, heat producing, and gravitational energy that's released as these things come together begin to melt. The planetesimals melt and differentiate into an iron core, a silicate mantle. This leads to all sorts of new minerals. And then you have transformations by heat, transformations by water, aqueous alteration, which gives you the first clay minerals and oxides, hydroxides, and also impact minerals as two objects collide at high speed. There are new high pressure forms of minerals that form in those sort of collisions. And we have all sorts of new friendly and familiar types of minerals getting us up to roughly 250 that are known in the various meteorites that fall to Earth still today, just like the one that fell in Russia. Certainly in that Russian meteorite, some of these 250 minerals will be found. And so that's been a continuous input to Earth's surface since its formation four and a half billion years ago. That's stage one and two. Now if you think about it, this is what things looked like back then, but there's an enigma here because those objects, the four in the planetesimals, had every one of the chemical elements that now is separated into separate mineral species. Something like 80 different elements that form rocks and minerals. And yet, there are only about 18 different elements that are manifest in specific mineral phases. All the rest of them had to be present. When you hold a chondrite mineral meteorite in your hand, it has all 80 of those elements, but nobody knows where the elements are residing. Where's the beryllium? Where's the uranium? Where's the niobium? Those elements must be present. Are they in what's called solid solution? Do they sort of sneak into the crystal structures of other minerals? Are they concentrated at grain boundaries between two crystals? Maybe they're nanophases that we just haven't seen yet, but nobody knows. So this is one of the great mysteries. It has to be there. Here's the Ur mineral elements. Here are the new, new ones that we add in stage one and stage two. So we start seeing, we're working from the top of the table down, mostly still the even numbered elements, which tend to be more abundant in some of the processes that form elements, but it's a rather intriguing list and all the elements that are not yet present in the mineral kingdom. Now we come to stage two. This is the era of physical and chemical processes that rework the outer layers of Earth. Earth has now formed. Earth is now a planet that has a iron nickel core, a silicate mantle concentrated with magnesium, silicon, oxygen, and iron, and a thin crust with many other elements. And the differentiation processes then, physics and chemistry involve partial melting of materials, of various sorts of fractional crystallization where you have a melt, crystals form, and sometimes they're denser and they sink out or they float to the top. This is a way of separating out different compositions and starting to differentiate the elements. Magma emissibility, sulfur-rich magmas that don't mix with silica-rich magmas, for example. So you can separate elements and you can go through normal processes that are well known in petrology classes if you take them. The discontinuous series of minerals that form with iron and magnesium, shown on the left up there. The classic diagram of Norman Bowen with a continuous series of feldspar minerals. Those are calcium, and sodium, and potassium aluminosilicates. And these minerals are the most abundant minerals in rocks at Earth's surface. That's stage three. And if you have a world that's volatile poor that does not have a lot of water in particular, then you're likely to get, like the moon or mercury, perhaps 350 different mineral species. But right now, our estimations is that's the end point. Moon and mercury are not going to go very much farther than this. You're not going to find new exotic minerals on these worlds, and you're not going to find very much more than the 350. So that includes the 12 Ur minerals, the 60 chondrite minerals, going up to the 250 minerals you find in all meteorites, perhaps 100 more from the processing of a planet scale object. But if you have a lot of volatiles, especially if you have water, you can have other phenomena that take place and lead you much farther in the direction of mineral diversification. You have volcanism. You have outgassing, you have hydration, you form clay minerals, you form hydroxide, you form ices, you form evaporites. 500 mineral species, we think. Now on Earth, there was a very dramatic event that occurred at this point, early in its history. Perhaps 30 million years in age, Earth was when it was hit 
by a second planet-sized object called Theia. It was perhaps a little bit off-center, and when it collided, we had this incredible impact that has been modeled in various ways of two objects kind of smoosh together and twist around and then other materials thrown out. That created Earth's moon. Earth's moon was like a giant reset button. All minerals went extinct. All 500 mineral species that must have been on early Earth disappeared, and it was a great magma ocean encircling the entire globe. And moon, the moon also was a molten sphere, but very quickly cooled. You went right back to 500 minerals. I think that's a pretty deterministic part of the story. And so we're right back to where we started, but now we have a moon hovering actually very close to Earth in the sky. We wonder, is this as far as Mars went? Probably it's so. Mars certainly got to stage three, but as you'll see, the next stages take a great deal of internal heat. Mars is only a tenth the size of Earth. It doesn't have that internal heat to remelt and reprocess much of the crust and upper mantle. And so our plucky rover Curiosity is there right now. It's measuring the minerals. Many of my colleagues and friends who are listed on that initial uh, list of collaborators are mineralogists who are working on Curiosity, and we're finding out what Mars is made of. And just stay tuned. The next year should be really fascinating. But I'm predicting we're not going to find any radically new minerals, and the minerals we do find are amongst the 500 that we predict that would occur in any Earth or Mars-sized body that's wet and has gone through this process of differentiation. Now, stage four is the formation of granite. There's a curious thing about the way rocks work. If you take a rock, take your kitchen countertop, if you have granite or basalt or some other such rock. If you put it in a very hot oven and let it start to melt, it doesn't all melt at once. It isn't like ice, which melts at a particular temperature, because there are many different minerals all mixed together. And what you'll find is you start getting melt along the grain boundaries. And the composition of that melt will be different from the composition of any one mineral in the rock. It will have a different composition, something that's termed the eutectic composition. In many cases, that composition is much more silica-rich than the rock itself. So if you melt partially the rock that forms most of Earth's mantle, something called peridotite, rich in peridot or olivine, if you, you know, the birthstone of one of those months, then you get something called basalt, which is much richer in silicon and aluminum than the original peridotite. And then you mantle Earth and other planets with basalt. But if you then take hard basalt and partially melt it, that fractional melt, 10, 20, 25% melt, will have the composition of granite, which is even more silica-rich, concentrates aluminum and potassium and sodium. And so you get the separation of elements. So on Earth, there's enough internal heat to partially melt that basalt to produce granitic continents that floated up and, and formed the outer scum on top of our planet. And granites give you something very special mineralogically. They give you something called pegmatites, about a thousand species, mostly with very rare elements that wouldn't otherwise have been concentrated. Those elements concentrate in the very late stage process of crystallizing out a granite, coarse grained minerals. Now, if you look, the pegmatite elements are ones that we haven't seen before as separate mineral forming elements. Lithium and beryllium, fluorine, phosphorus, Niobium, uranium, and several others. This enriches the mineralogical repertoire of Earth's near-Earth environment. We have the first boron minerals in tourmaline, beautiful gemstones you've seen. The first lithium minerals in spodumene. Beryl, which forms emeralds and, and, and aquamarines. Tantalite, which is a mineral of tantalum and niobium. And a really amazing mineral of cesium. Cesium is an incredibly rare element in the periodic table, and yet you can form crystals that are 10 meters across. Indeed, the world's entire cesium supply comes from one mine in Canada where there's giant crystals. This is what pegmatites give you. But pegmatites require a long time of selecting and concentrating fluid rock interaction that concentrates elements into those very, very late stages one polyocyte crystal, you know, the size that you find in those mines, may represent 100,000 cubic kilometers of rock. This experience fluid rock interactions. That takes a long time. It perhaps takes more than a billion years. 
which is why these minerals don't occur right away. It seems like it takes at least a billion years, maybe closer to two billion years in some cases, to produce these rare minerals and pegmatites. And then stage five, plate tectonics, something that only Earth in our solar system seems to, sh seems to show. And plate tectonics involves huge global scale processes which include fluid rock interactions as a result of subduction. You have wet, dense crust, cool crust, which goes down in Earth in subduction zones, swallowing up pieces of crust as new crust is created along Mid-Atlantic Ridge and other places where they're spreading centers. So this down-going slab is wet that partially melts the rocks above, and many millions of cubic miles of Earth's crust then is reprocessed again. And we have all sorts of new mineral forming events. We have new kinds of volcanism that occur from this. We have massive deposits of metals, sulfides, sulfa salts, hundreds of new mineral species here. We have new high pressure materials that never occur before occurred at Earth's surface, because some wedges of sediment are taken down, they plunge down to depths 100 kilometers or more, but then wedges pop back up because they're buoyant. And they carry with them when they come back up these very dense. So jade, jadeite, is one of those minerals that only can occur very deep in Earth's crust and then pops back. That's one of the reasons why it's rare and precious. Here we get the 1,500 mineral species. You've seen five stages. That's half of the 10 I'm going to talk about. And up to this point, we've seen only about a third of the 4,600 minerals that are known on our surface. Now, try as we like, we can't find any other mechanism. Oh, I've got to tell you about this. This is an amazing recent concept in geology. You know, there's, there's new ideas that are always coming along. And one of them is just recently coming to focus is the idea that plate tectonics may not have been around for all of Earth's history. You know, I just sort of blithely assumed that, well, plate tectonics, you know, global circulation, early in Earth's history, you're going to have large convection cells, and, and you're going to have new crust forming, and you're going to have subduction, and so forth. Well, it doesn't appear that that's true. It turns very early in Earth's history, it seems like things were more chaotic, and you had very tiny cycles that really didn't let subduction happen, and that most of the mountain building was the result of plumes of hot rock that were coming all the way from the core mantle boundary, rising up, vertical tectonics, if you will. And a variety of geological and geochemical evidence is now suggesting that modern style plate tectonics didn't get going until three billion years ago. And that's when sort of organized larger convection cells got into motion that subduction really could get going. And so it wasn't until three billion years ago that many of the minerals I'm telling you about could have formed. This is sort of a fascinating revelation, but it shows that you know, we're learning a lot of new things, interesting things, and that the mineral record may help us understand those just by the ages of different mineral species. So, so here's this basic conclusion about the second era of mineral evolution. Chemical and physical processes, primarily through fluid rock interactions, leading to a whole variety of new minerals, but we really get stuck at 1500. And so we need something else, and what we need is biology. Stage six. Oh, this is, yeah. this is such a, a curious thing. You know, many of us working in the origin of life have realized long, long time ago, you can't have an origin of life without minerals. There are many different roles they play. They catalyze reactions like sulfides. They can template reactions like clay minerals. There are other sorts of intriguing chemistry that happen, for example, with boron minerals, and many other minerals have been invoked. But simply, the origin of life could not have occurred on a planet without a rich mineral repertoire. By the opposite token, the evolution of minerals couldn't have occurred without life. This is what I mean when I talk about the co-evolution of the geo and biosphere. Most minerals on Earth's surface are a consequence, an indirect consequence to be sure, but a consequence of biology. A shocking revelation that as a mineralogy student a number of years ago, uh, none of my professors would have listened to, but it's true. Stage six. This is the period when life first arose. And all of those early microbes are a fascinating group called chemolithoautotrophs. These early primitive microbes simply ate rocks. Chemolitho, that means they got their chemical energy from rocks. What they did was they looked for places where you could have oxidation reduction 
reactions, just like you have in a chemical battery. Reactions in which electrons flowed from a more reduced form, like a metal or a reduced rock or mineral, to a more oxidized form. And as they did, electrons flowed through the microbes. The microbes had that little burst of energy, and that's what kept them going. The microbes weren't doing anything new. They weren't doing anything that wouldn't have occurred on Earth anyway, but they were speeding up those chemical reactions. They were catalysts in that early Earth. And as a result, you have new deposits of iron minerals, of phosphate minerals, of carbonate minerals, thick deposits that are distinctively biological that were formed because the microbes were speeding up chemical reactions. They changed the distribution of minerals at the face of the Earth. And as a result, for example, of making carbonates, the carbonates were then exposed to very hot igneous rocks in places that led to whole suites of minerals called scarn minerals, minerals that would have occurred in small amounts before, but now were occurring abundantly on Earth's surface because of the actions of microbes. So this is stage six. We don't think there are any new minerals that occur here, but the distribution of minerals at or near Earth's surface and their morphologies were profoundly different. That's what we're looking for on Mars. If we're going to find microbial life on Mars, we're going to find it because we see these very distinctive patterns of minerals that are different from a non-living world. But the big one, if you want to remember one of those 10 stages, it's stage seven. That's photosynthesis, producing oxygen. Because it was the production of oxygen using the sun's energy, not chemical energy from the Earth, that radically transformed the near surface environment and led to the diversification of minerals. We saw massive deposits of iron. All the major iron deposits, the iron ore deposits on Earth, are from this small interval of time. All the manganese deposits on Earth that we use for mines are from this small interval of time. Indeed, thousands of new minerals occurring as a consequence of putting oxygen into the atmosphere. Earth changed. It changed to a red planet. It changed to a planet that had green life. It was getting closer and closer to what we think of as the modern living world. Now, I have to defend this idea. This is pretty radical. The hypothesis, the two-thirds of all the minerals that you see when you go to a mineral museum, the crystals that you find on those shells, those glorious colors and shapes, they're a consequence of biology. So. What we're going to argue is that there are many, many lines of evidence suggest that before about 2.5 billion years ago, there was essentially no molecular oxygen anywhere on Earth. There simply couldn't be. And it was only with the rise of molecular oxygen that you could produce many of the minerals that can't form otherwise. So here is a kind of graph that you will frequently see in the geological literature, this one by Lee Kumpf at Penn State, looking at oxygen through time. And what he shows here is over four billion years, one, two, three, four or more billion years in the past, he sees a very low level of oxygen up to about 2.5, a rapid rise, stability of maybe a few percent of modern levels for another billion plus years, another rapid rise because of glacial effects, and then modern levels with lots of squiggles up there. What he doesn't talk about, nor many people do, is how low it was before 2.5 billion years, and that's the key. That's the crux. There are lots of published estimates from people who think that there was a fair amount of oxygen at the time, but that's been largely discredited. To a number of people who say it's less than 10 to the minus 5, so we're talking about a logarithmic scale here, less than a 10,000th of the modern sort of levels. A model of atmospheric oxygen that says it's 10 to the minus 13th, because there's always a small amount of water molecules that rise high into the stratosphere. Ultraviolet light hits those water molecules, it breaks them apart, the oxygen stays behind, the hydrogen escapes into space. And so on an Earth-like planet, you're going to have a small amount of oxygen being produced that's going to be present in the atmosphere. What we will argue is that if you go even a millimeter below the surface, into the rocks, into the ocean, there is no molecular oxygen. We argue it's 10 to the minus 70th. That's a different number. That means there's not a single molecule of oxygen anywhere beneath the surface. OK, why do we say this? There are all sorts of mineralogical clues. We see minerals that simply could not form with oxygen around. 
we see soils, ancient soil horizons that don't have that ferric iron, the red soil-like material. We see evidence for oceans that are rich in iron in its more reduced form called ferrous iron, Fe2+, as opposed to Fe3+, which is the red oxidized rusty sort of thing. We see waters with very, very low sulfate. They have sulfide instead, and we'll see what that means in a second. We see europium anomalies. We see all sorts of things. And so we make plots like this, very simple thermochemical calculations where the horizontal scale in this case is the pH of ocean water, so focus on the middle range here, around pH 7 or 8. The vertical scale is a log scale of oxygen. Think of it as partial pressure of oxygen, so 10 to the minus 90, 10 to the minus 85th, and up to the top of the scale. And if I said nothing else, the reason we are quite sure this is true is there's a buffer. Now, any of you in high school, you remember your, your chemistry class, you've done titration experiments where you buffer pH. Well, you can also buffer the amount of oxygen that's present because we have two chemicals that are in abundance. Magnetite, which has Fe2+, plus, hematite, which has Fe3+. Plus. And as long as there's an abundance of both Fe2+, plus and Fe3+, plus, you put more oxygen into the system, you're buffered. The oceans are buffered. The soils are buffered. Everything beneath the surface is buffered at 10 to the minus 72. You cannot get away from this on the early Earth. This is everywhere, 10 to the minus 72. Well, we know, for example, that uranium minerals are stable in this environment. That means you have to be somewhere below 10 to the minus 62. There's the sulfate sulfide line. We know that the oceans had sulfide and not sulfate, so you have to be someplace below 10 to the minus 70 for that to happen. And there are your europium anomalies, and that's more like 10 to the minus 78. This is 70 log units or more below what we are today. This is an astonishingly different chemical environment. Okay, so what does that mean? What minerals could you form? What minerals could you not form? One of the most important marker minerals are carbonates, the most abundant repository of carbon in Earth's crust. And in the Archean period, in this ancient period, they formed iron carbonates like siderite and anchorite. Okay, so you can make a plot of how siderite might form. And here's a slightly different plot. On the horizontal scale is the amount of carbon dioxide in the environment. Because to make a carbonate, you need to have sufficient carbon compounds. The vertical scale, again, is the partial pressure of oxygen. So you have to be to the left of this line, and you have to be below this line, and that's that little rectangle there. So you have to be someplace in there. That means to make siderite, which we know is a common Archean mineral, you have to be below 10 to the minus 68. There's no other way to make siderite. So what wouldn't form? Take two of my very favorite minerals, azurite and malachite. These are beautiful blue and green copper carbonates. You've all seen them. They're, they're wonderful stones. They're decorative pieces. They're some of the favorite in the museum. And here's the plot again. Carbon dioxide amount on the vertical, on the horizontal, oxygen on the vertical. You have to be someplace to the left, and you have to be above that line in order to be in the stability fields of azurite and malachite. That means you have to be greater than 10 to the minus 42. This is 30 log units higher in oxygen pressure or fugacity, if you know that term, than the Archean world. You simply cannot get to this stability field. You're so far away from this, it's just a distant, distant concept. It was not until oxygen was present, molecular oxygen was present in the atmosphere that you could start thinking about forming these minerals. So what couldn't have formed? Almost all the copper minerals are unavailable. Any of those beautiful blue or green phases like turquoise and dioptase and chrysocolla. When did they form? They had to form after the Great Oxidation event. And by the same token, almost all the uranium minerals, almost all the manganese minerals, the nickel minerals, iron minerals, cobalt minerals, molybdenum minerals, tungsten minerals, uranium, just go down the list of the, any, any element which can form in multiple oxidation states is going to be severely restricted. So this is the most single, most significant factor. It's life producing oxygen, oxygen changing the surface environment so radically that new minerals could form, which never could form before. 
But the story is more complicated than that because we're talking about a change in the atmosphere at 2.4 billion years ago. That's the great oxidation event. That doesn't mean the subsurface becomes more oxidized. And so we said, what's a proxy? What's a proxy for creating ox oxygen in the near surface environment where minerals form, the top kilometer or two kilometers of Earth? That's very different from the atmosphere up above. So we said, let's look at an element that's extremely sensitive to the, the oxidation state. And rhenium in the mineral molybdenite is one. Now, okay, rhenium is an element 75. It occurs very close to molybdenum. They proxy for each other. Both of these elements in their lower oxidation state, the 4 plus state, are very insoluble. They don't go into aqueous solution. They don't move around. They just stay put. But if you get more oxidized, then molybdenum in its six valence state, rhenium in its seven valence state, become mobile. They become part of the fluids. They move around and then they concentrate in minerals. And so what we're arguing is what you're seeing here, going back three and a half billion years to the modern time, rhenium concentration in molybdenite, which is the commonest ore mineral of molybdenum. And it's so great because rhenium also has a radioactive isotope and you can use it to date individual grains of molybdenite. So we have here from the literature, the ore geology literature, hundreds of analyses of molybdenite, their age, their rhenium concentration through time, and you see that before about 1.5 billion years ago, very, very low rhenium contents. There seems not to be a lot of mobilization of rhenium. You look for the next billion years or so, and there's a pretty significant level, and in modern times, the levels get much, much higher. Now, this is a little bit of a speculation, but we suggest there's the great oxidation event, Looks like there may be a delay. There's the next oxidation event caused by Earth glaciation. Looks like a bit of delay. And if you put these lines in here and see this kind of step function, the statistics don't bear this out yet, but we're going to get more data. It's sort of like that first oxygen graph I showed you. This is flipped to make it look the same. So don't be too put by the fact that it's backwards. But you look at those steps, you look at these steps, maybe, maybe, maybe this is kind of fun. We're just this is just coming out. It's in press. It's not even published yet, but, but that's kind of fun to us. Anyway, here's a hypothesis that there was a great subsurface oxidation interval that post-dated the great oxidation event by hundreds of millions, maybe a billion years. And we can learn more about how Earth's near-surface environment changed by doing this kind of experiment. Stage 8, the intermediate ocean, the boring billion. A period of a billion years when it seems like life did nothing new, no great innovations, when it seems like Earth's oceans did nothing new, that the continents, well, they did some interesting things. They came together and split apart. But it doesn't seem like there were a whole lot of new mineral species at this point. Now, having said that, when you start looking at the record of minerals, something really striking is happening. These are the first appearance of beryllium minerals over the last three billion years, three billion, two billion, one billion, modern time, appearance of the 106 known beryllium minerals. And what you find is that there are two intervals where there's a huge leap in diversification of beryllium minerals, and they both occurred during the boring billion when nothing much was supposed to have happened. We have no idea what's going on here, except we have a hint, perhaps, in the supercontinent cycle, which I'll come back to in a little while. That's, that's hold on to your hats. Stage nine, snowball earth. There are periods of global glaciation followed by very rapid periods of global hothouse periods. The cycles here hold lessons for us today that earth can go through very radical, very fast changes in climate when they reach tipping points. In this case, the continents happen to be along the equator. We have ice spreading, spreading, spreading down and as the reflective ice puts more sunlight back into space, Earth gets progressively colder. You have a snowball Earth, perhaps Earth completely covered by ice, which, by the way, is a mineral, H2O, in a very well-known crystal structure. So ice becomes the dominant mineral at Earth's surface. Most other minerals are buried. It stays that way, but CO2 keeps being produced by volcanoes. Eventually, you have a runaway greenhouse effect, and things tip 
the opposite direction, back and forth and back and forth. These glacial cycles give all sorts of interesting mineralogical consequences during the hothouse episodes where huge masses of carbonates are deposited very, very quickly. But we don't see a lot of new mineral species here. We just see a lot of ice at the surface. Now, it's interesting when you look at the cumulative number of minerals of boron and beryllium, right during the snowball episode, we see nothing, nothing. So I don't know, if these are all very early results. There's a lot of things to be studied here, but Ed Grew's work on these minerals is really quite meticulous. And so it appears that there's an interval of almost half a billion years when there's simply no mineralization corresponding to those snowball episodes. And then we have stage 10, the Phanerozoic, the terrestrial biosphere, the rise of life on land. For the first time, only the last 8% of Earth's history, Earth becomes an Earth-like planet, at least the way most of us think of it, where you could live on land, where you would not be suffocated by uh, the atmosphere, where you could find something to eat. Such familiar biosphere. And here we get up to the modern number of species, including biominerals and other sorts of things, carbonate minerals forming various kinds of shells, silica forming shells, other sorts of minerals produced by biological activity and transforming the near surface environment. We have all sorts of organic minerals appearing for the first time. Minerals, many of which form in caves or in rotting wood or in other sorts of materials where you have crystalline compounds, but these compounds are carbon-based organic molecules that form the minerals. About 50 of these are known. So these are also from this stage. There's also some amazing changes in near-surface mineralogy. As the ocean chemistry changes, the calcium-magnesium ratio of the ocean changes, as it does episodically through Earth's history, depending on how much material is running off the continents in erosion. You get shifts from these limestone forms. The, the, the coral reefs, for example, form primarily of calcite or a different form of calcium carbonate called aragonite, shifting back and forth. And amazing adaptations, trilobite eyes. Now you look at these eyes, each one of these eye facets is a single crystal of the mineral calcite, calcium carbonate, with a C axis of this mineral pointing outward. Now, you probably know if you've ever seen a calcite crystal, how you have very strong refraction effects. You see something called double diffraction, if you've ever seen that. But the thing that is very difficult with calcite as a lens is red light and blue light bend differently. So you have to correct for what's called chromatic aberration. And the way this happens in a trilobite eye is every one of those single crystals is zoned from the center to the outside with different ratios of calcium to magnesium. I defy anyone to grow a crystal of calcite that is radially zoned with, but the trilobites did it. That's an amazing bio-innovation. So biomineralization was not just this simple process. It can be very, very subtle. The nano-engineering of these perfectly engineered eyes, and I won't say engineered in an intelligent design sense, but evolution has led to a set of crystals that allow the trilobite to see more clearly. It's pretty amazing what happens. And then also the black shells of these trilobites, when you start looking at those, these also are tiny molecular, in some place crystalline forms, little fragments of chitin that have preserved the original atoms that made up that trilobite carapace are still preserved. They still, the fragments of the organic molecules are still present. So this is pretty amazing what you can find in the biosphere. Okay, so what are some of the implications of this field of mineral evolution? It's a new way to think about different planets and moons. 350 minerals on Mercury and Moon, 500 on Mars, 1,500 on Venus, over 4,600 on Earth. And when we think about it, this gives us tempting targets. When we go to other planets and moons, what do we look for? I think we should look for granites, first of all, and pegmatites. That'll tell us something about the internal dynamics of the planet. We should look for massive sulfide deposits to tell us if sulfur has concentrated. And that also is a very good place to look for origin of life type chemistry. We should look for carbonates, banded iron formations, evaporites. These are all things that tell us about the history of a world. This is a wonderful way in terms of teaching mineralogy to bring the excitement of Earth history to this, what has often been a very dull science of mineralogy, memorizing mineral formulas and so forth. The Ur minerals, for example, they encompass all the great properties of minerals that we want. People say, oh, you can't teach mineralogy this way because we have to talk about chemical bonds. 
they're all present in the air minerals. We have to talk about polymorphism, diamond and graphite. We have to talk about physical properties, carbon polyhedra, phase equilibrium, all these topics, they're all present. This is a great way to introduce mineralogy. And of course, the most exciting thing is that there are previously unrecognized patterns that are hidden in the minerals. Supercontinent cycle, changing ocean chemistry, the rise of the terrestrial biosphere. I want to share with you at the very end of this talk some of the most exciting things that are just now coming to light. First one is the supercontinent cycle. There are periods of Earth history when the continents have come together to form giant supercontinents, and then the continents break apart. We're in a period now where Pangaea is still breaking apart. But there was a continent called Pangaea, and there were four others before that, four cycles. Now, if you look at the distribution of minerals through Earth history, it turns out they're not steady state, but rather they're pulsed. The easiest mineral to look at is zircon, zirconium silicate, because it always includes uranium, so you can do uranium dating. People have dated thousands of zircon crystals and their pulses. They're pulses of crystals corresponding to the assembly of supercontinents. Because when continents come together and they collide, they form great mountain ranges like the Himalayas. There's igneous activity, there's redistribution, there's fluid rock interactions, there's mineralization. That's what we're seeing. And when we look, molybdenites show the same age distribution, the same pulses. When we look, beryllium and boron show the same pulses of mineralization. When we look, mercury minerals show some of the same. Here's mercury minerals, the number of localities, the number of new minerals, and not very much data. Mercury is pretty rare. We have 127 localities where we have mercury minerals. But we see Kennerland, we see a pulse. Columbia, we see a pulse. Pangaea, we see a pulse. But there's a great gap in mercury mineralization, a billion years when there's no mercury mineralization. Look at this, this emphasizes it because there's the beryllium minerals in blue, the mercury minerals in red. Beryllium is going crazy during this period. Lots and lots of new mineralization associated with the formation of the Rodinian supercontinent. But a billion or more years when there's not a single known mercury locality anywhere on Earth. We don't know what's going on. We have speculations. It could be that mercury is sequestered in very insoluble minerals like cinnabar in that sulfitic ocean of that period. It could be that there's a microbial process that was sequestering mercury for a time. The invention of what's called mercury methylation by microbes that were poisoned by that mercury. It's also possible that it's buried in various kinds of lead zinc deposits that occurred for the first time here and that the mining companies don't really want to talk about because mercury is so toxic that you can't get some of that data. So there's possibilities, but we really don't know. But let me show you just one last contrast to how fascinating mercury and the whole relationship of mercury to other elements is. Here is the burial of organic carbon over the last 600 million years. And we see a huge pulse. That's when the coal measures are deposited. It's called the Carboniferous Period, a period when there was a huge burial of organic carbon because of the flourishing of forests on that first terrestrial biosphere. And now look at mercury mineralization, a tripling of the abundance of mercury minerals. And every major mercury deposit on Earth occurs during that interval. And that's because mercury can bind very easily to organic molecules, especially sulfur-bearing compounds. But it also then, so, so coal measures concentrate the mercury, but any hot water flowing through will liberate the mercury and concentrate it and make an ore deposit. So we think that's what's going on here. And that interval then becomes the great mercury mineralization zone in great contrast to that billion year period we saw before. Okay, my conclusions, very simply. The mineral evolution of terrestrial planets progresses in both deterministic and also in some chance stochastic ways. That there are different planets or moons achieve different stages of mineral evolution. That the three mechanisms for producing different kinds of minerals. And finally, and for me as a mineralogist who has loved minerals since I was a child, I think most importantly, with mineral evolution, the science of mineralogy once again assumes its rightful place at the center of the earth and planetary sciences. With that, I thank you. I thank my funding agencies and welcome questions.
I understand there are two microphones here for questions. I really would love to uh, engage in a dialogue. And especially if there are students who want to come up with the questions, I would I, I really love that interaction. Yeah, and, and you, Yes, in the front here. Can I see a mineral azonite? Oh, yeah, I slipped that in. Um, yeah, I was very, very honored uh, a couple of years ago to have a mineral named after me. There, I mean, there are 4,600 minerals. And, and the, the way mineral naming is, if you have a, a colleague who identifies the mineral, they, they can request to have a mineral named. The thing I like about hazonite, it's the only known mineral that is only produced by microbes. There, there, there are lots of minerals that are produced by life, but they're also produced non-biologically. But hazonite is only known from Mono Lake in California as microbial excretia. <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> um, I, I'm, not, I'm not a student, but I was wondering if you um, used to be a student, uh, if, if you had any comments on the dolomite, do, the presence of dolomite, and back when I was in school, it was uh, oh the dolomite uh, controversy. The dolomite controversy. So this is one of the real great long-standing questions in geology. It's been around for more than 200 years, I think 220 years, when the dolomite question was first raised. Dolomite is a carbonate which forms massive mountains. And it's a calcium-magnesium carbonate, which, frankly, we don't see being deposited today. It's just not, we don't find it in the oceans. And you go into a laboratory and you try to make a dolomite precipitate out, and it seems almost impossible to do it. And so the idea was that the dolomite mountains that we see, the great mountains, they're called the dolomites in, in the Alps, um, that these were formed by having calcium carbonate, limestone deposited, and then magnesium-rich solutions flowing through, and at a later stage, altering them. Well, it turns out there's some fascinating recent experiments that have shown that if you take certain microbes and introduce them to ocean water, they will deposit dolomite as opposed to calcite. And so there's now some speculation that those great massive dolomite mountains may actually be primary features or may have occurred very, very shortly after limestone was deposited through microbes. See, see life alters Earth's surface in so many ways, and those tiny microbes working over millions of years can have profound effect to make mountains of different minerals. So that's a great question. Um, how do you find like, out how many different minerals are on, diff are on different planets? Uh, how, how do you find, the question was, how do you find how many minerals are on different planets? And you know, we re other than some of the moon rocks that we have and a few meteorites that have been blasted off the surface of Mars and maybe off uh, a couple other worlds, we just basically don't have direct evidence. We sort of make speculations and we kind of know. Now, curiosity which is right now starting to dig and drill into Mars' surface. It has the, an X-ray diffractometer. It has various ways of analyzing these, these materials through spectroscopy. We may know directly of a whole bunch of new minerals that occur on Mars that we hadn't positively identified before. But it's really hard to know. And yet, you know, we can sort of make educated guesses based on what we see on Earth and what we find in those meteorites. That's a great question. Yes? Um, minerals form only, you mean, that only are formed with, um, through living materials like I mentioned some of these organic minerals that are formed in cave deposits that are part of, uh, you know, guano deposits uh, uh, when, when there are lots of bats present or decaying trees and so forth. Um, those, those minerals are certainly very specialized in, in where they occur. Um, but it is also conceivable that you'd have organic minerals on non-living worlds. There's speculation, for example, about the mineralogy of Titan. Titan, the moon of Saturn, is very, very cold. There are estimates that there's liquid methane lakes, natural gas lakes. And some people have speculated, well, what if you had evaporites, evaporites, that is, things like salt crystals that occur around the edge of an ocean that evaporates? Well, what happens if methane evaporates? 
what do you have there? And some people said you might have acetylene crystals. So acetylene crystals could be ringing the edge of the lakes on Titan. It's a fascinating thing, and maybe some other exotic organics as well. That would be a mineral that does not occur on Earth, but does occur on Titan. Kind of as a follow-up to that, and then I have a, a second question. I'll ask them both, and then I'll let you answer. Um, are there minerals that we attribute to human processes, manufacturing, whatever, that would not exist, we don't think, if humans weren't doing it? The other question I had, um, are buckyballs, you talked about early uh, carbon, uh, graphite, and so on. Are buckyballs, because they're round, not a mineral because of that shape, because they're not crystals? Let me take the second one first. Are buckyballs minerals? A single buckyball is not considered a mineral. It's a separate molecule. But if you could find a deposit where the buckyballs lined up and formed a crystalline array, that would be a mineral. And it wouldn't take much. I think if you only had 10 molecules by 10 molecules and a few molecules thick, that would be enough if you could image it in a, an electron microscope and get electron diffraction off that group of molecules, it would be considered a mineral. Now, um, there are certainly naturally occurring buckyballs, many in ancient soot layers after fires or after asteroid impacts, there appear to be the formation. The other question about human mineralogy, I love this question, uh, stage, are we in stage 11? Are we in the anthropogenic or anthropocene type period? And in terms of minerals, a mineral is still defined as a naturally occurring crystal. So if we manufacture a laser crystal, a yttrium aluminum garnet crystal, or some special exotic um, rare earth element material for a phosphor and a screen, those would not be considered minerals. But as soon as you take those objects and throw them out, put them into a waste landfill, and they get weathered, there's opportunities for all sorts of new exotic minerals that occur through a natural process by weathering human materials. And indeed, we know of a number of these because in mine dumps, in old smelters, there are a number of minerals that simply do not occur except in places where human activity has produced an unusual concentration of element. In those 90-some mercury minerals that I was showing you earlier, there are at least four of them that are only known from mine dumps in California. Sharp-eyed collectors collect the old rock slag, and I don't think that they would likely occur at our surface except for the fact that humans have been involved in the process. So maybe we could call those stage 11 minerals. Yes? Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, uh, how do you guys figure out, uh, how do you guys figure out that like diamond was the first mineral in the universe? Like, How would you go about finding that? Okay, so how, this is, this I have to say is speculation. What we do is we think about what are all the physical and natural processes that occurred early in the universe. The very first stages, there was hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. And some people said, oh, well, maybe you could have lithium hydride form as a crystal. And that's a possibility. And, and we have to give that. Lithium hydride is not known as a mineral on Earth today, but in the cold darkness of space, if you had enough lithium bumping into hydrogen, that's possible. But you didn't have any oxygen then, so you couldn't have formed water ice. You didn't have any carbon or oxygen. You couldn't form CO2 ice. So you need to form stars out of helium and hydrogen. And when those stars, you know, the first stars that were energetic enough to release all the chemical elements through a supernova or an AGB type star, Carbon is the abundant element in the outer leaf. So we just said, it's hot, it's carbon rich, it's cooling down. What forms? The highest temperature carbon rich material is, is diamond. And it's a much higher temperature than any of those other compounds. So diamond and then carbides and then nitrides, just because you're dropping in temperature and you have to use one of the abundant elements. You can't invoke gold or uranium or something that's very, very rare. So that's why we say that. But we're, you know, we'd love to have people come up and say, hey, I got a better idea. And that's exciting. I mean, that's really fun when, when people think about new questions and come up with new answers. And my second question is, is it possible to get molecular oxygen without biological processes? Ah, uh, yes. It's absolutely possible to get molecular oxygen without biological processes. And there, there are half a dozen ways that have been shown chemically that this can happen. A lot of them have to do with photoprocesses at or near Earth's surface. I mentioned one where 
water molecules rise high into the stratosphere, ultraviolet radiation splits them apart, the hydrogen escapes the gravitational pull of Earth, more massive oxygen doesn't, you can get molecular oxygen that way. You can also get molecular oxygen through various ultraviolet processes at the surface where, where um, a nitrogen environment interacts with rocks and minerals at the surface and you can get various kinds of reactions where the nitrogen will react with one of the elements in, a, in an oxide and the oxygen is reduced. So there are a number of chemical reactions. They all involve very energetic either ultraviolet radiation or cosmic rays or some kind of ionization process. So they're not simple redox reactions, oxidation reduction reactions. That's what the microbes do when they do photosynthesis. Yes, over here. So you mentioned earlier that humans have been sort of like the 11th stage. What do you think the more common 11th stage would be like? What do you think the next progression would be in terms of mineral generation? Mm -hmm. I, I, I love this question. Um, where is Earth going? And I think I have rather depressing news for you. <laughs> because we think that right now we're really a kind of an apex of mineral forming. We have created, because of life on Earth's surface, this huge oxidation reduction gradient. Back in the Archean before the great oxidation event, from the deep rocks to the surface was maybe 20 log units in that oxygen scale. We're now at 100 log units in the oxygen scale from the most reduced to the most oxidized surface conditions. It's really hard to see us getting beyond that. There's also not much chemical novelty except what humans do by concentrating weird elements in, in our various electronic and other technologies. So, so what we think is probably we're going to start seeing over the next three billion years a decline because the sun is getting warmer. The sun has for the last four and a half billion years gradually gotten about 30 percent hotter and it's going to continue to get hotter. And by most estimates now, if the sun continues over the next billion to two billion years, the oceans will begin not only to evaporate, but Earth will lose its water. Well, that will be a dry, desiccated planet. We're a dry, desiccated planet. We start losing minerals. We start losing clays. We start losing hydroxides. We start losing other hydrated mineral phases. Then the surface gets hotter and hotter. And, and eventually, you go through stages of mineral extinction until we become more and more like the surface of a planet like Mercury, which is blasted and hot and, and very dry and not very habitable. And it's all very sad. <laughs> yes, we'll go for this side next. Right. Has anybody formulated a hypothesis of how this could help figure out whether there are life on planets that we have discovered but haven't been able to actually get to? You know, this, I, I, we love thinking about this, and this is why the NASA Astrobiology Institute in part supports our research. Because minerals are very robust, they survive a long time, and even when organic molecules might be difficult to spot or life forms may go extinct, the minerals will often persist. And so we're asking, are there certain minerals or suites of minerals that point unambiguously to life? At this point, we're not quite ready to go that far, but certainly on an Earth-like planet, if you see azurite and malachite, it's just Im it's impossible for me to imagine how you can get those minerals without having life produce this very, very extreme gradient of oxidation reduction. It, that's what's preserving these. And if that gradient goes away, if life disappeared, if photosynthesis ended, then you no longer have the chemical regimes in which these minerals can form or be stable. So if we see on another planet some of those copper minerals or, or some of the, the other oxygen sensitive minerals, I think that that may very well be uh, a symbol. But this is all very, you know, we've got to be very cautious about making any claims. If, if tomorrow the Curiosity rover says, look, we found this azurite deposit on Mars, <laughs> I'm not going to jump up and say, life, life. No, I'm going to say, wow, then how could that have happened? And then we go back and we think about it very, very carefully. But that's, that's the way we're thinking about it right now. Please. Um, another question about oxygen. So you're dating, you're effectively dating the Earth by the oxidized um, minerals that you're finding. But I don't really understand how you got there because you're talking about, you know, 10 to the minus 70 atmospheric pressure of oxygen. So 
how would you know that that mineral existed at that atmospheric pressure? Because to generate that in a lab, I mean, clearly it took billions of years for the for the world to Earth to generate it. How did you guys manage to figure that out? There are chemical approaches uh, which involve looking at thermochemical parameters of rocks. You can measure for each mineral. You can measure its entropy, its heat capacity. You can measure uh, various uh, the total amount of free energy that's represented by that mineral compared to the, the elements. These are all things that can be measured quite straightforward in a laboratory. And then you can do calculations what's more stable under certain circumstances if you have more sulfur, or more oxygen, more carbon in the environment. So you can make these calculations and in fact decades of, of work in geology and ore geology for example where different mineral deposits are formed have borne out that these predictions are very robust. This is a very important way to understand why we see certain minerals on Earth today. And so we just apply those to Earth's early environment. What we know about where oxygen would come from, what we know about the sulfur cycles, what we know about the minerals that are preserved as primary phases that occurred back in those days. And so you can therefore use that evidence because the, the minerals, many of them are preserved in the way they formed billions of years ago. And they give us a little time capsule of different periods of Earth's history. So I, I hope that answers at least part of your question. Yeah. Yes. Um, I've always assumed that when the sun uh, was throwing off all sorts of elements, uh, would there not be a, a good probability that oxygen and hydrogen would combine and make water? And if it was out far enough that it would become crystalline? Absolutely. And ices were certainly part of the mineralogy of that early solar nebula, but much farther out beyond Earth. So if we're looking at Earth's early mineralogy, um, it, Earth was much too hot. It was much in a zone where you would not have had crystalline ice. You wouldn't have had crystalline carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide or those other things that we term as ices. They would have been present in our solar nebula in, in the much colder, far out regions, and of but course where comets form. Out as far as Mars yes, and absolutely. beyond. Yes, absolutely, and that would have been present. Uh, and, and those may be, indeed, some people would suggest those are some ur minerals as well that occurred, not because they formed at very high temperatures in the envelopes of stars, but because they condensed as ices in the pre-solar environment. So those are very possible. Um, we just haven't clearly identified those yet. They don't, they're not preserved when they fall to Earth. Thank you. Um, this isn't a life-related question, but it probably fits more in a stage three to five, I think. Um, I read a book here a while back that was relatively old, so it's not cutting-edge geology, but they were talking about the formation of um, gold and uh, minerals, uh, metals, and talking about how they probably formed very deep down, but the right combination of pressure and uh, temperature allowed them to essentially precipitate out in an area of high concentration, and perhaps the mother lode in California was in some exotic terrain developed in that and then accreted to California. And the same thing in upper Michigan where all the copper is. There's something about that area that created that sort of condition. So that's one thing. Are those minerals or metals probably more common than one suspects, but the fact that we only see them once in a while is because we only see areas of the right condition. And two, they often seem to have a common carrier. You know, gold is often associated with quartz. Is there something about those other things that are symbiotic or create that reaction, or is it something about the condition of there that just makes them precipitate out at the same time the other metal does? So. Thank you. Yeah, the question was about formation, for example, of gold and copper ore deposits where you can find vast quantities of a fairly rare element in concentrated form. And this is a perfect example of that first of the three processes of mineral formation where you select and concentrate elements by certain kinds of fluids. You need a very hot fluid, sometimes under pressure, sometimes with solutes. So gold, I forget whether it's chlorine or there's, there's some, there's some other elements that are in that solution in a hot brine, and they tend to then concentrate into that liquid, that water-rich fluid, very high temperature, high pressure. They tend to concentrate gold atoms along with everything else. And you can imagine this fluid circulating under cracks and fissures, working its way underground, perhaps rising up into cooler zones. And the characteristic of these fluids, which is astonishing, is that they can carry quite a lot of a dissolved material 
but they hit just the right pressure or just the right temperature, it gets a little bit cooler, a little bit lower pressure, and bang, it all gets deposited out at once. And so those veins where you see the quartz, that means there was a lot of silicon dissolved in the fluid. The gold was precipitated in some of those veins simultaneously. But nearby you'll find many veins with quartz and, and no gold at all. So the gold was very sensitive. Same thing with those vast de copper deposits uh, in, in Michigan. It looks like there were hot waters that just concentrated and, and had to process huge volumes of crust as they, as they per percolated through selectively. The copper wasn't really comfortable in any of the minerals. It doesn't fit in pyroxenes or feldspars or, or micas or any of those other common minerals. Instead, it goes into the solution. Ah, there's a better, more comfortable home for me. Concentrates, moves, and then all of a sudden, bang, it deposits when you hit a certain horizon. And that's why you get these massive deposits. It's really a, sort of a mini example of the whole diversification process of those first few stages of Earth's history. It's a great question. I have <clears throat> two questions that aren't really related, I don't think. Uh, first, um, I noticed that Venus had the most minerals besides Earth, I believe, of the inner planets. Uh, is that correct in one of your uh, data slides, I think? I don't know what to say about Venus. You know, uh, Venus early on probably was very Earth-like. There's even discussion they might have had water. It looks like Venus suffered a great catastrophe. And it very well may have been an impact like the one that formed Earth's moon. Earth's hmm. moon was formed partly because the impact of Theia was slightly off-center. So it caused a large amount of the matter to spill out into orbit and form a moon. One of the suggestions has been that Venus also suffered a huge impact very early in its history. This is an impact that caused Venus now to rotate the wrong way. You know, Venus is the one planet that has what's called retrograde rotation about its axis. So it's going the right way around the sun, but it's spinning the wrong way. Mm. Now what happens if you have a off-center impact that causes you to spin the wrong way. You can imagine this big body comes in, gives you all this angular momentum. You're spinning the wrong way. Up th that moon goes into orbit, but because you're spinning the wrong way, instead of like Earth's pulling, you know, the moon is gradually getting farther and farther away from Earth yeah. because Earth is rotating a little bit of head and it's transferring Ingram. If you rotate the wrong way, you pull the moon in. And so, so you had this great impact that created maybe a moon early in Venus's history. Then Venus sort of got re-smushed. Um, it lost its water. All the water went off. It now has this thick CO2 atmosphere. The surface temperature is like something on the order of 500 Celsius. Uh, there's no clay minerals. There's no hydroxides. There's, you know, this is a mineral extinction event that was just catastrophic. And Venus probably has not gotten back up to, to 1500. It probably at some point was at 1500, and we think it's drop down and, and ex estimate exactly what in that very high CO2 atmosphere. You know, I'm, I haven't just, I just haven't really given a lot of thought and it's hard for us to see the surface and we can't recover samples easily so, but it's a wonderful speculation and it gives you the sense of how very different planet histories can be because of these stochastic, these chance events as opposed to the deterministic you know, let's form peridotite, let's form basalt, let's form granite, let's make hydroxides, let's make oceans, you know, let's make life. That's, that's one scenario, but it's not the only scenario. And then the other thing, uh, the DCO, uh, that, that kind of research, deep carbon, I, I think of carbon sinks, such as the ocean and the forest, of course. Any of your research at all uh, looking at the role of carbon, as a, uh, or the earth rather, deep earth, as a carbon sink, Oh. And is any of this uh, possibly a practical or engineering benefit uh, for our uh, global warming crisis that's coming soon? Thank you. We have, yeah, thank you. That's wonderful. The Deep Carbon Observatory, which I did not talk about tonight, is a really amazing effort to try to understand the global carbon cycle. But the carbon cycle that goes all the way down to the core. We think there may be 20 or 30 times the carbon that's known in Earth's crust deep underground in other forms and other phases. But one of the amazing things that's happening right now on Earth, and now you have to think geologically in terms of time scales, is that subduction is carrying carbon from the crust down, down, down into the mantle, even into the lower mantle, perhaps to the core mantle boundary. A billion years ago, Earth was hotter. And carbonates, when they went down in subduction, 
they decomposed and the carbon dioxide came back up in volcanoes. But today, Earth is much cooler and the carbonates which are trained in this subduction zone, much of it still goes down. By some estimates, 98% of the carbon goes down. What's more, 200 million years ago, there was a radical change in the carbon cycle because for the first time, life evolved what are called planktonic calcifiers, little shells that can swim in the deep ocean, and when they die, they sink to the ocean floor. And for the first time, rather than having carbonates only forming on the margins of continents, carbonates were being deposited into the column of sediments in the deep ocean. And those are sediments that become subducted. So more carbon gets buried. And more carbon gets buried because basalt at mid-ocean ridges goes through a process of carbonation. And you get carbonates forming there. And so more and more carbonates are now being formed in the deep ocean, are being deposited in the deep ocean, are being subducted, and less and less is coming up. So I'm working with a colleague, Rajiv Dasgupta, in Rice University. Our calculations right now, and they're preliminary, and we're not ready to publish this, but I'll just tell you the punchline, is that at the present rate of burial of carbon, Earth's surface will have lost almost all its carbon in 300 million years. It's a consequence of biology. It's a consequence of the forams falling to the floor. It's a consequence of forests dumping more and more carbon into the soils, which then wash into the continental slopes and become part of that ocean sediment column. It's a consequence of the very success of life that it may be dooming itself over a period of hundreds of millions of years. However, this will have absolutely no effect whatsoever on the modern, what we think of as the carbon cycle crisis, because humans are pumping more than 100 times more CO2 into the atmosphere every year than is produced by every sequestration mechanism we can imagine and every volcano that's producing CO2 coming out. We are two orders of magnitude larger effect on the carbon cycle than anything that is recorded at any point in Earth history. This is a fact. Two orders of magnitude larger. Year by year, we are producing a century worth of volcanic gases into the atmosphere with no consequent sequestration of that carbon. What this will imply for Earth's climate, we don't know. We're not doing those calculations. Other people are thinking about it. You've all read about it. My question to anyone who talks about this subject is if there's something we can do about it. I and mean, we're running a great global experiment here. It's fascinating for those of us who are interested in climate models, but, but uh, shouldn't we sort of take the part of caution? And conservation is not going to hurt anybody, I don't see. So me two questions, please. I think you sort of already answered my question, but I was going back to that idea of the redox potential. And you mentioned like during, like during the Carboniferous, it's when a lot of the reduced carbon was buried in the Earth. And that's when the redox potential became really extreme. The largest. Like during that time, yeah. The largest during that time period. Is so that drawing in now with the stage 11, and you're already sort of talking about this, with, now that we're, we're moving that reduced carbon from the Earth and, and burning it and oxidizing it, how we're changing that redox potential and what that's going to do mm -hmm. Yes. So the question is whether this is going to radically change the oxygen levels. I think it's very possible we'll see some drop in oxygen levels, but you know, there still is a lot of photosynthesis going on. There are feedbacks. So I don't think we're going to see a, we're not going to see a short term effect between the carbon and the oxygen levels. That's something that takes more time. It takes, it, it takes thousands to millions of years. Yeah, yeah. So, so to really change the redox couple at the surface, is much more, because CO2 is redox neutral in this particular event. But you're right that if you take buried carbon, you burn it, you are consuming some oxygen. It's just going to take a very, very long time to see the effect on that, that redox couple. That, that, that would take you know, a much, much longer time. We're, we're much more concerned about the, the atmospheric composition of, of greenhouse gases than we are about oxygen levels changing. Your last question. Yes. Um, Asteroids and meteors and comets, what stage would they be at? Great. Asteroids, meteorites, and comets. Now, if the meteorites are those chondrites, the very primitive sort of meteors that show very, very little processing other than the initial heating stage, and those are not uncommon meteorites. There's a lot of chondrite meteorites. That's all stage one. 
And there are only about 60 different min minerals that we find in those. And by the way, of those 60 minerals, 30 of them are nanophases or mic micron-sized minerals that have only been seen with transmission electron microscopes. So, so there are really only about 30 minerals that have any volume significance. In terms of comets, a lot of these have ices. They also, we know they contain some of those pre-solar grains that have the ur minerals. And a lot of them seem to also have some of the basic minerals that form the other meteorites because they kind of collected material. So they may have up to, you know, a couple of hundred different minerals. Asteroids uh, are, are often even much more complicated than like tiny pieces of planetesimals, but tiny by several miles in diameter. And they could easily have, have hundreds of minerals as well. But if you take all the different asteroids, meteors, comets, put them all together, we think there are about 250 phases, of which only 100 are volumetrically significant that you could actually see if you looked at a sample. And those 150 of them are micron, tiny, tiny things you can only see with microscopes or, or electron microscopes and so forth. But still, they're there. I mean, they're they are real mineral phases. Thank you.